the topic that I would like to discuss today uh, is how to go from scratch to scale and the critical actions needed for success based on the 200 innovation and venturing tracks that we've done with our company so far. Um, so first of all, where I want to kick off is that scaling is really one of the hardest things to do. Uh, I think everybody knows this. It's also one of the one of the yeah, biggest topics, I think, of today. Um, and I'd like to go deeper into it. What can actually make it successful? Uh, and um, specifically, what we see is that the common problem of scaling is that a lot of, and specifically too many corporate ventures, get stuck in what's called in startup life as the land of the living dead, uh, which is um, corporate ventures that are out there, out there being unsuccessful, unvalidated, uh, lacking corporate strategic purpose, but actually at the same time also eating all the venturing budget. And by doing this, also taking away corporate venturing confidence, which I think is one of the biggest hits that um, some of these ventures take, is that suddenly it takes the confidence away of the of the corporate doing the corporate venturing as a whole. Um, so that's a common problem that um, I see. Um, and the common reasons that I see for this is basically uh, most of them have not validated their propositions uh, earlier, so they don't really have a customer need at that point, but they've gone already so far, so it's very difficult still to kill. Um, or there is no real corporate scale to, to leverage, so no real assets that, that the corporate has to actually scale the, the venture, um, not choosing the right success metrics, the wrong entrepreneurial team, an inco incompatible uh, ownership uh, structure, and an unstructured legal setup. These are just some, I guess you guys have seen maybe more uh, reasons why, but I think these are the, the most common ones that we see here in our office. And I'd like to dive deeper into some of these today based on our experience. Um, uh, of course, this is just an, an, a snapshot of where we are also today. We are a, a corporate venturing development firm that's been active now for around six years. Uh, before we were a product design studio for I think in total, our company exists for 12 years. So what I'm showing today is everything that we've learned and uh, the, take, the takeaways from it, but happy to learn also from you guys. But this is at least what we have uh, brought together as the actions that we think are crucial to take. So um, the actions can be divided into three elements. Um, I think the first one is process. So how can you define clear venturing milestones uh, and metrics? The second one is around the team. So how can you recruit and uh, an effective venturing squad in three about ownership, uh, about selecting an entity format that suits uh, growth. So these are the three topics that I would like to highlight today, um, starting for the first one with process. Um, in specifically process, there is two things which I think are quite crucial. One is the having a certain path that you follow without too much structure. I think in too much structure is not necessary, but at least you need some procedures that you go through. And the second is that continuous consumer validation is um, crucial uh, for the venture to be able to succeed. And to be able to scale, you will need both. To dive deeper into this, um, I'm not going to stick to this uh, framework, I think, for a long time, because it quite, I guess it's quite familiar to some of you already. But uh, to, to align on terminology, the stages that I see here is venture creation and venture growth in general, where in venture creation, uh, I split up into discovery and pilot, and then eventually growth into launch and scale. Uh, basically, the discovery track starts from a corporate value space uh, fit that you have already in place, going through a problem solution fit, where then in the pilot, you try to go as fast as possible to product market fit with an MVP or minimum viable product, then going through launch with, a with a trying to achieve positive and sustainable unit economics, um, achieving your product channel fit, and then going to scale, which is the exponential uh, growth to venture maturity. So this is uh, basically um, how I see it right now. Um, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the metrics that we use at these moments, because I think that's already one crucial element that uh, that corporates could look at at these points in order to be able to scale successfully. Where at the discovery part, you, you will see that we look um, much more to market sizing, consumer insight, already looking at buyer intent, which I will go deeper into uh, afterwards, um, going into the business case and also looking at what the corporate leverages that you can take while in the pilot, we are going much more 
into what is the real customer acquisition that we can uh, achieve, monetization, the growth channels, retention and feasibility. While in the launch, which is quite crucial, we actually, the two elements that we mainly look at are lifetime value and cost of acquisition. Um, and of course, your cost structure and operational efficiency. But I think lifetime value and cost of acquisition are quite crucial in that phase to, to have those in place. Um, and then in scale, we're looking at sustainable growth, economies of scale, uh, and uh, month over month or year over year growth, uh, how far you're able to uh, penetrate in the market and the return on investment. So these are the metrics that we uh, propose in each of these stages. Um, now, what I would like to dive a bit deeper into is three actions that we think are crucial to take within this process and these metrics. Um, and the first one that that I see mostly as as um, as one of the, yeah, the the potential pitfalls in a lot of uh, projects that we've done is that a lot of the projects are being taken to pilot and into launch while actually they could have been killed or validated much earlier. And also, as you can see, the budget and time perspective on this um, on this line, you can see that of course the later you wait, uh, the longer you wait, the higher the cost. Of course, so we push as much as possible to validate and kill or pivot faster in the first phase. And at the same time, also in the second phase, also track and measure strictly still there. Um, and I also stress, especially there also to still dare to kill because a lot of corporations have taken their venture already to that stage. And then it's very hard to still say goodbye to something that they have invested in for such a long time. But I still, I still think that there is a lot of opportunity there to do even more. So um, I'd like to dive a, a little bit deeper into this. Um, so how we do this in a in a first stage, and which I think uh, is is an is a good way to look at it, is, is that you um, run very data driven validation experiments in this phase very early on on a concept phase, um, actually faking your product or your service or your business unit um, or your business already in the market as if it would exist. So it means we run um, smoke tests, such as what you're seeing at the screen right now, it's just something which we've done for Grower, is we run um, really uh, landing pages with click-through rates and with landing pages and with everything as if it seems uh, to be true to the end consumer, although the product does not exist at that moment, but it, with very, with very uh, limited resources, we are able in that way to, to, to track real uh, data already very early on. And that enables us to gather already um, this type of uh, metrics, giving you uh, click to, uh, click, cost per click, impressions, click through rates, uh, visitors, uh, product pages, intents, and click through rates on buyer intent. Um, this, of course, is a demo for it. But uh, this is a way I think that a lot of the uh, business case elements, which uh, are always a bit unclear, can already be filled in. Like, for example, the first idea of cost of acquisition can already come out of this type of exercises. Um, so this is what I what I would look at at the very early stage uh, validations. While if you go later on and you go for more to the growth stage of a of an uh, of a scale up, this is one of the scale ups that we've uh, built late, lately. Um, where then, of course, you look at more at uh, the monthly logins, or you look at year over year revenue growth or yearly revenue partnerships or the team or I mean these are a lot uh, of different metrics and you can see immediately that they're also quite different from each other um, but I think it's crucial and in each of them I'd like to stress that that looking at from a data perspective is is really crucial while I still see quite um, yeah some corporations looking at it from more of like a more subjective interview questions sometimes while the data really proves um, can really prove your business case already quite early on. So these are two ways. Um, and then I think the other um, crucial aspect here is not only to look at the consumer, but also taking it back to the to how the how the perspective is towards the towards the corporation itself. For example, a lot of uh, ventures they arrive maybe at scale, but then they don't really have actually the corporate leverage to actually scale further, or uh, also they are not in line with the corporate strategic purpose. And then at that moment, you end up in this again, in this, uh, let's say the land of the living dead, because the, the ventures don't really have a purpose then at that moment or, on, or are also unable to scale. So I think taking also next to the consumer data, 
also the perspective of on the one hand the strategic purpose and on the other hand um, the, to leverage to be able to leverage the corporate assets are quite crucial um so this is one element so the the looking at the data quite validation uh like very data driven i think the the second one that i would like to highlight um the second one I would like to highlight is do not skip the pilot. Uh, I still see a lot of corporations that uh, think that they are going to build a pilot, but eventually, instead of building it in three to six months, they build it in a year, and they're actually uh, building the two perfect product in, instead of trying it out on the market very soon. Uh, it seems that quite some corporations are still uh, quite afraid to, to kickstart with something that's maybe not perfect yet. So uh, definitely a tip. Uh, do this maybe under an incognito brand so that you can test easier and also don't get in hassle with legal or marketing departments from within the corporation. Um, and then three, what I would like to say on a process part is also um, push the integration or leverage point far enough. Also, like uh, I see a lot of corporations that are already in the pilot point, pilot phase, trying to connect it to the internal CRM systems or the IT systems, but of course slows down the the uh, the venture so i think it's crucial also to at least wait after your launch so you have real data that you can implement um so that actually that you don't kill the venture at a very crucial and fragile stage wait until it has certain traction before you start integrating it in um to your system so i would suggest to do this after the launch um so quick wrap up uh, of this first part of process Key takeaways for me are focus on the metrics that affect decision makings, uh, use data to kill or pivot faster, do not skip the pilot and uh, time your integration wisely. So far enough, in my opinion, to be able to let the venture also explore enough by its own in its agile way. Uh, so that's process. Um, then on team, uh, scaling and validation require a complete different set of skills. I think that's my main message here. What I see is that there is a complete difference between venture creation and venture growth in terms of how you work and with the people that you work. So if you look at the venture creation, there is a lot of ideation, validation, and uh, pivoting ongoing. While if you're looking at venture growth from, from the launch on, it's really about launching and scaling the, the, the venture. And those are also different people. You need entrepreneurial people that have a scaling mindset uh, with specific domain expertise. And those people, in, in our opinion, cannot be the same people uh, as the venture creation uh, part, or at least let's say it's rare that you find those people in, in all in one. So our suggestion is here that on the first end, you look more at the continuous team that's validating, uh, ideating and validating your propositions. But once you start going into venture growth, that you actually have a different team that is able to take this uh, actually further. Um, and that is also open to to take the risk that is that is often uh, related to these type of uh, startups as well. So that's um, uh, important for us to highlight here. Happy to hear your thoughts also in the Q and A about this. But this is something that we really learned in the in the past couple of years that there is a crucial um, difference. An example here is that we've just hired, or we are in the process of hiring, for example, an external CTO, a CGO for Forecasty, which is an, um, a corporate venture for uh, of Chemovator, which is a subsidiary of BASF. And there they also went through the process and it's also an internal incubator for internal uh, entrepreneurs. And there they really had also the same opinion as we do. Like there is a crucial difference between the two profiles and they actually learned in the past couple of years that um, they try to do it with the same people. And now they are also changing mindsets slowly to also uh, looking at external people to do the growth. So this is one of the examples here. And Camovator is quite interesting to look at because they are even incentivizing these people in growth stage with even going to majority equity stake at that point. So that's quite an interesting case to look at. Um, However, it's not only about, of course, the CEO, but it's also about how can you how can you build the whole team around it? And I'd like to give a little bit of a perspective also on this one. Um, so um, we see this kind of as a multiple multi-team setup that is built around the venture. And, and this is also quite crucial because there it can already define a lot of the success of your venture. You have, of course, the typical 
in the in the purple you can see the venture team which is typically you have a project lead customer journey expert in the beginning beginning and a marketeer designer and prototyper in the beginning let's say of course if you then i'll move to the next slide for a second in the next slide in the venture growth you see the ceo cfo cmo and cto with their execution team but around it it's quite crucial that you also have the venture board in place that has a quite direct link to the ceo if possible um, at least have uh, division leadership people involved that are mostly the venture sponsors, uh, the director of strategy, portfolio, venture director, and the other elements that are needed in this venture uh, board is quite crucial because otherwise you will see that your venture at certain points will not be able to move forward uh, without these type of decision makers in place to ha have funding, for example, at certain stages where, it's, where speed is quite crucial. Then on the other hand, you have the internal team such as portfolio venture director and methodology experts, innovation support. And these are the people that are more involved in getting the framework of how you implement the methodology and scaling it over multiple ventures is being done. Um, that's quite crucial to optimize your methodology. And then you have below on the blue part, the ad hoc expertise, which we see more as like, for example, financial expert that's needed at a certain point, uh, maybe domain expert uh, expertise, maybe somebody of production. It could be any time, any type of, uh, uh, it could be also be legal, but any type of profile needed as an ad hoc expertise in your team. So these are the four, let's say divisions that we would, um, having your team um, which seems quite some if you look at it at from one venture perspective but then if you look at it this is kind of a visual where um, in the in the purple circle you can see what if what does this do if you have for example eight ventures and then you can see that this type of venture board is immediately scalable over different um, uh, over different ventures so this is definitely a setup that can be scaled also looking at we're not looking at only scaling one venture, but I think it's also crucial to look at how can you scale your 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 venturing framework as a whole. And I think this is a setup that definitely works uh, if you want to run multiple ventures at the same um, time. So this is a uh, small overview of this. Um, Another crucial element that I think here, I, sometimes it might sound a bit cliche, but those things are really important to have in place, which is to have a very open communication insights uh, that is continuously happening between the team, um, where you cannot wait for stage gates or something if certain questions or uh, problems arise, uh, that there has to be a continuous feedback loop across all teams and that the transparency is super crucial in an entrepreneurial environment in these type of ventures. So openness and a very flat hierarchy to have this transparency in place is, is crucial to us as well to be able to um, yeah, pr to be able to be successful with the ventures. Um, I give you just a typical ideal feedback loop that we see here. So mostly we would like to see the venture board at, at like one or two on a rhythm of one or two months, where then um, if we talk, for example, with uh, methodology experts and portfolio directors, that's kind of like once or twice per week. Uh, same with the proposition lead and then ad hoc experts can be once per week, depending on which kind of uh, expert need is needed. So this is kind of um, the, the rhythm. And also in below, you can also see the type of communication that's related to each of these uh, experts. So for example, Venture Board will be much more, of course, about the portfolio overview, uh, the barriers that you're having and, and boosters that we can, that we should ask for. While of course, if you go more to the right side, it's more the business in the venture itself on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but that's quite logic, I would think. Um, so this is on the uh, team part. So here, my key takeaways are that um, scaling and val validation require a complete different uh, set of skills. And I think that's, for me, at least one of the most important ones here, uh, where I see a lot of corporates struggling with. Um, then consider external leadership talent while when scaling. Um, and then make a clear difference between the multi-team setup and create a continuous and transparent feedback loop. So these are the takeaways from the team. Happy to hear your thoughts and, Q and questions around this as well later on. Um, the last part that I would uh, like to discuss um, is the right entity format for your growth. And here, yeah, to be honest, like the entity setup uh, from what we've seen already and the partnership choice can be the difference between life and death of a venture. It's a... Uh, it has nothing to do with the content, uh, nothing to do with the team, but even already the setup of the of your mechanism of venturing can already define 
um, the success of it. And I'd like to dive uh, for a second into it, um, where I think two different two questions are quite crucial for the venture itself. So one is, um, do we spin in or do we spin off the venture at a certain point? Uh, and spinning in means creating a new business unit. Spin off is a, a separate legal uh, entity in this case. Mm, I'm sure you've probably have different terminologies for it, but this is kind of the, the way we see it. And then the second question is, do we uh, do we build by or partner? Uh, which is also a crucial question that, that has impact on time and, and how you set up the, the whole venture. Um, I think that where you should ask yourself those questions in our opinion is um, after the pilot. So that means that before, I don't think it's absolutely necessary to create separate legal entities or anything like that. Like I said before, I see the, first part more or we see the first part more as a kind of a mechanism that continuously provides new potential value propositions and once they are validated and they get real then you should ask yourself the question um, what you should do with them also in the first part almost 90 percent of what we do in the first part is done under incognito brands well then afterwards they are being um, decided whether they should become part of the mother brand or branded by the mother brand, but that makes the first part process go a bit quicker, as I mentioned before. Um, to go first into the spin-off and spin-in um, decision, I, I'm not going to run through this whole um, scheme uh, that's going to probably take us too far, but I would like to focus um, that, that there is quite some criteria that have impact on your spin-in or spin-off decision, uh, strategy, governance, legal and procurement, people and operations, finance and tax, branding and marketing and others. Um, but what I did do here is I highlighted the ones that have, in our opinion, quite impactful uh, decisions on scaling. And there you can see that, for example, from a spin-off perspective, in general, you have more um, focus and you can build up more autonomy and decision-making structure, which of course enables more agility. And also from a legal and uh, procurement perspective, uh, it insulates you more from liability, uh, makes the procedures a bit easier. Uh, from a people and operation perspective, it's easier to have a dedicated team on it uh, so that they are not uh, spread around corporation, but they can really fully focus on it. Um, also easier hiring procedures that you don't have to follow the, the mothership procedures. Um, and um, so these are some of the spin-off perspectives, but I think from a spin-in perspective, there's also reasons why you would scale from, from that point of perspective. And it's I think it's more coming from the, it's easier there to leverage the existing brand portfolio, the channels and the departments. And I think that's definitely a crucial decision if they're the closer you are to the core and the closer you want to um, yeah, also uh, maintain that type of uh, leverage, then I think you should go more for a business unit uh, kind of approach, where, as you can see also on the bottom, that there is also an ability then to leverage the existing assets easier of the corporation as an unfair adventure. I'm not, I don't want to say that it's impossible from a spin-off perspective, but I noticed that it's just easier um, from a stakeholder management perspective to do it and from a business unit perspective. So this is more the theory around it. Um, I would like to include one more element to it um, before I dive in a couple of examples. Like um, I also like to see this more from an innovation matrix perspective where I think that everything that's more related to core innovation or existing offerings or existing new uh, existing markets can definitely be done. I think with the spin-in or business unit perspective, the more you go outside of your core, the the more it makes sense to um, to do a spin-off structure. To give you an example of this, um, we have done uh, two. Well, we've done multiple, but two of the example projects we've done with Telenet, which is a telco company, uh, so a large provider of digital cable, television, fixed and mobile telephone services. We have um, worked in two ventures for them. And the first one is a mobile home internet, uh, which actually is easy plug and play without any wires, uh, which normally is connected in the traditional way of working of them. That's really, in this case, really seen as a business unit because of course it's very close to their uh, core business offerings. It leverages and, and uh, accesses, of course, a lot of the core assets, and it maintains very close strategic synergies with the mother company. So there, we decided to set this up as a, a new business unit. Um, in the other structure, uh, you were talking about the park, which is the free roam virtual reality park. 
And as you can imagine, that's definitely different capabilities than yeah, than what they traditionally have as a telco company. So there, um, it was easier to decide for a completely new market, new capabilities needed. So that was easier set up as a as a separate spin-off. So this is on the innovation matrix again. These two are can be seen in this way. Um, and then there is a third element which I would like to dive into also from the spin-off perspective. In this case. For Telnet, there is also the mother brand, Liberty Global, which is also the mother of um, Vodafone Zigo, for example. We, by making this a spin-off, we were also able to access other brands of Liberty Global and leveraging on those uh, brands, which, again, from a business unit perspective, would have been um, a bit more difficult, uh, as you can imagine. So in that way, we were already um, able to scale in the last three years up to 12 locations at this moment across three countries, which is pretty quick in that type of market. And it's definitely the setup has definitely uh, been one of the factors why we could do this. Um, then I would like to quickly dive into do we build, buy, or partner? Um, there, I think the two elements that are crucial to decide on this is one is the capabilities. Do you have the capabilities in house or? Do you not have them? And on the other hand, what's the speed of scale you want to have? Do you want to access this market immediate or are you quite flexible um, in time? And do you want to more build up the capabilities? And, and is it not so tight to, for example, the, the time taken uh, needed to go to market? So these are the two elements. And as you can see here, that defines also uh, the buying partner um, or the build perspective. For example, if you have limited capabilities and you want immediate, immediate access to it, then uh, maybe in, in a lot of cases, buying or partnering is, is a very... Um, a very good perspective to look at it. While if you have a, if you have the capabilities at hand and you're a bit more flexible in time, then definitely look at building uh, to integrate the capabilities in your corporation. Um, that's one perspective. I think there is, of course, especially yeah, a lot of corporations tend to look at buying as sometimes the ideal solution in the beginning. But there is, of course, a lot of other aspects that also play, such as, uh, and that's one of the, uh, the downsides sometimes of, of uh, especially MNAs, is culture is, a, is, of course, something that you have to take into account. Uh, the legal governments, synergies, uh, risk tolerance, for example, the regulations around it and the budgets, of course, that you have. Building it from scratch can be, uh, can be cheaper uh, if you have, for example, uh, if you have, of course, the right assets in hand. Uh, M&As can tend to be sometimes quite expensive, but of course, again, you have quite fast access to the market. So these are a couple of other things you should take into consideration. Um, I'm going to give also um, examples of this, of how we looked at it from a couple of cases. So um, we, one of the ventures that we've built with Biosurf, which is the mother brand also of Nivea uh, Skincare, um, We've built a new corporate venture being OWN, uh, which is a direct-to-consumer uh, venture that's uh, on a, on a subscription-based business model. So it's quite different for them. Uh, and it's completely personalized. So it means that uh, the, the skincare that you buy is completely tailored to you. So in um, for, for buyers, this was kind of quite close to their core because it's still skincare. But on the other hand, they had to look at small-scale production and they had to look at uh, direct-to-consumer business model. So it was kind of exploring new horizons for Bayersdorf. And in that way, I think it makes total sense to then look at it from a build perspective because you are also building the capabilities that you might need as Bayersdorf anyway in the upcoming time to use also within other of your ventures in the future. So you are building the small small scale production capability, for example, and getting also more into the new business model. So that was the reasoning behind building this corporate venture. Um, while uh, I think this is quite the opposite, um, BNP Paribas is one of the other brands we work with, which is a, a, um, one of the international known banks uh, offering wide range of financial products. And for them, we've been looking at uh, mobility as one of the potential spaces to uh, walk, to go into as the bank. Um, we've done first value explorations, value space exploration and stuff like that. But eventually we ended up that they were going to explore certain value propositions in that space. But yeah, there, since they didn't have really a lot of capabilities yet in mobility, um, it was easier to look in this case, to look at the investment cases. So eventually we um, helped them also in assisting in investing in Optimile, 
which is an all-in-one mobility solution for companies and organizations to meet daily travel needs. So this, you can see in this case that it's further away from their core market and um, they wanted to have quite immediate access to these type of solutions. Um, so then investment was uh, one of the a right strategy to, to have. Um, and then the last uh, case here that I would like to show also is the, the a partnering case where um, Telnet, um, uh, the telco that I was mentioning before, at a certain point wanted to go further than offering just uh, telco services, but offering total home solutions. Uh, so actually really provide, for example, renting a place and also giving you, uh, like, for example, uh, any type of extra services such as your laundry and stuff to, to your home, uh, offering this as a total package. And doing by doing this, they're of course going into a complete different market, uh, going into construction actually. And in that case, they they partnered up with Willeman um, to actually create a joint venture around this, where, where actually here you can see that the offering is really in, in new for both of them, but in a kind of the way they're also using each other's capabilities, of course. So then joint venturing in this case made a lot of sense. So this is a joint venture that we set up and it's also the reasoning behind why you would do this. Um, and that brings us to partnering, which I think is one of the crucial elements that we would also like to um, yeah, highlight as it's not in every case, but I see it in 80% in of our cases, partnering is really a key element to be able to scale quicker in the beginning um, of your venture. And uh, for example, DNB, uh, one of the largest uh, financial services in groups in Norway um, has set up VIP uh, VIPs uh, and it's a mobile banking app that gives you the possibility to make payments to, uh, to a, telephone, a telephone number instead of a bank account. Um, and the, re the, the road to their success, as you can see on this slide, is actually that yeah, how they've grown since 2015 to about 4 million users in 2019 is especially through the different partnerships that they've done every year to be able to uh, aggregate more and more users and to offer more services. And I think that's really one of the key learnings that I would have from a corporate venturing perspective in general is that these type of partnerships really play a very crucial role in your uh, scaling. Um, to go a bit deeper into that specific partnering, because we think it's one of the one of the uh, key uh, leverages, is that they come into quite different formats. Um, as you, uh, just to highlight you how we think about these in general, is that mostly, as you can see with this Nespresso example, is that mostly you have one player being like, let's say the architect that defines the standards and the rules of the of the ecosystem. Well, then there is also the enabler, well, in this case from Nespresso Crips is develops the goods and services for the other ones for the coffee machine. Uh, and then you have the participants being in this case, the Nespresso club member. So you always have different kind of roles you can play in this ecosystem. And what we've learned is that especially in scaling your venture, it has benefits of not always being the architect of the ecosystem. While a lot of corporates tend to always try to be this architect because it feels in kind of a way safer to do this. Um, we think it makes a lot of sense also to uh, not be this architect and actually uh, to be the enabler. Well, the, and in that way you can access the enter a new market actually a lot faster um, and also hedging your bets by participating in more than one uh, company and in that way also lowering your investment requirements. So that's definitely a tip that we would like to give in the partnership uh, perspective. Yeah, and then there is, of course, also the way you set up your partnerships. There's a lot of ways you can do this. Um, you can do this very open, such as Airbnb, for example, or such as uh, what Apple is doing in the App Store. They have certain, they have like a managed uh, partnership where they give certain accesses to some people and uh, some not to other companies. Well, for example, Netflix does it very exclusively. So there is a lot of choices that you have to make. Um, if you go through that uh, type of process, and that's definitely a takeaway that, that you have to think about the criteria or the way you would like to set up these type of partnerships if you are scaling. Um, so yeah, also from this ownership perspective, I would like to give the key takeaways that um, yeah, you should assess the right criteria to decide whether to spin in or to spin off at a certain point to assess your capabilities and scale needs to decide on build by your partner. And um, that partnerships are, in our opinion, uh, often a key uh, leverage in scaling and that it should be tailored to exactly the needs uh, that you have, as I tried to explain in the last couple of slides. So this is the three elements that I would uh, that I would uh, like to give to you. 
Um, quick overview of them again. Um, so the key takeaways to ensure successful scaling for us is definitely from a process uh, side, have your right metrics in place, kill or pivot faster based on the data. Do not skip the pilot, as I said, uh, time your integration wisely. Uh, from a team perspective, scaling and validation are two different things, and if they have two different uh, skill sets. Consider external leadership uh, talent when scaling, not in every case, but at least consider it. Um, make a clear difference between uh, the multi-team setup, as I mentioned, and create a continuous and transparent feedback loop. And then, yeah, the key takeaways about the ownership, I just shared them, so the, the right criteria to decide on spin-in or spin-off and uh, buy, build, or partner, and then the learnings on the partnership. So these are my uh, most important key uh, takeaways that I would like to give uh, for now. And then maybe as a last is that, yeah, although of course everybody wants to scale, um, you can't rush it. And I think that's also quite an important thing that we've learned is that the, one of the reasons why a lot of these ventures end up in the, let's say the land of the living dead is because yeah, they try to scale when they were actually not ready to scale yet. So except for us that scaling takes time and definitely don't scale yet when you don't when you haven't reached to go to market fit. I think that's definitely an important key to, key takeaway that I would like to give because of course everything is focused on how can we scale as fast as possible. But on the other hand, I think you have to also realize that it just takes sometimes a little bit of uh, trial and error and, and doing this uh, with the lowest investment possible, I think. So that's uh, my main um, key takeaway from uh, that I would like to share with you.